Okay, welcome back everyone, and uh, welcome back to Aquinas and the Doctrine on Human Nature from his uh, Summa Theologia. And we're going to continue on with uh, Lesson 3, and we've got quite a bit of content that was added, because now we're up through page 105, and uh, to take 100 pages of content and reduce it to a one-page chart is a difficult task. So... Um, I apologize, but we've got a lot of content in just one lesson here we're going to cover. And primarily what he has introduced here, he has introduced uh, the intellect of powers to the intellect of soul uh, in the same way that he did with his sentient soul and its sentient powers. So now we have uh, all of the subcategories for the intellect of soul. We'll take a look at this. Uh, like I say, it's going to cover uh, basically the first hundred pages of his uh, presentation on human nature. So it covers just about all of his structure. We begin with the sentient soul, which is uh, a power of, as a form that moves the body through the modalities of cognition and movement. It is the actuality of body. It uh, possesses a potential power of knowledge that must be acquired progressively and formed into a sign model to be posited for um, the act of existence. It is subsistent substance because it is the substance of the intellective soul that will operate in itself. The intellective soul is the uh, primary fundamental aspect of the soul for um, Aquinas. But as far as the sentient soul goes, it uh, takes in the sensations and then it, it will transform them into psychical phantasms or psychical generalizations. And when it does this, it also attaches a node of uh, emotion from the appetite of desire as a uh, determining basically if the psychical generalization is desired or if it is should be negated. And then we're ready to take this uh, collective of phantasms, this lexical network of phantasms, and transfer them into the intellect of soul. But before we do that, uh, as we've discussed before, Aquinas gives us the actual uh, four internal sentient powers that uh, represent this uh, modality of conversion of sensation to phantasm. So this is a, an extremely important section because it plays such a significant role. So block two, the four internal sentient powers, number one is common sense or the commonality between all of the individual sensations, uh, the perceiving of the sensation as a sensory intentionality, and uh, basically the self compares and gathers a multitude of apprehensions into a singular common terminus. So sensation is converted into a spiritual impression or sensible form. So that's the first thing that common sense does is take the sensate and converts it to form, to sensible form. Now uh, the imagination kicks in here because the sensible form is identified as a psychical phantasm. It's named as a psych psychical phantasm by the imagination, and it becomes retained in a lexical network of phantasms by the imaginative memory. But then uh, Aquinas tells us there is the work of, a, of an estimative power here at the level of the sentient soul. Even at the level of the sentient soul, reason does kick in at kind of a proto-reflective type area. It's not full-on cognitive reason, but it is a proto-cognitive reason that does some uh, estimative power. It deliberates over each and every one of the phantasms and makes an estimated, uh, educated approximation of the intentionality for each one of the phantasms. What is the intentionality um, concerning the identity of these uh, phantasms? There is a kind of a, a little bit of a um, rational, deliberative work that does take place even at the sentient level. 
And then we move on to recollection because the intentionality estimates that are formed are compared to past psychical representations for further refinement. So the lexical network of phantasms gets further refined through recollection and a node of intentionality of a refined intentionality is attached to each phantasm before it is transferred to intellective soul. So we are um, get a great deal of assistance of a the upcoming transformation to sensible object to intelligible object by this work this rational deliberative work by the sentient soul by the sentient powers so phantasms are not just bare um, sensate forms they aren't just a bare sensate form a phantasm does have um, a little bit of a, a note of intentionality attached to it that the intellect is going to be able to um, reflect on and uh, consider. So then we're ready to transfer this lexical network of uh, phantasms with the node of intentionality attached. So we move on to block three, the intellect of soul, and the phantasms immediately become transformed into intelligible objects. They're received uh, in their unconditional state. The sensate um, outer core is stripped away, and the unconditional intelligible species of the thing is apprehended and taken into the intellective soul. So we gather up the intelligible species as intelligible objects. Now the intellective soul is a composite which consists of form making, or the ma formation of the unconditional form that will enclose all of the individual unconditional species forms into an overall overarching model, a sign model. That's the first composite part of the intellective soul. The second part is the returning feedback from previous work in positing and uh, acts of existence. We always have engaged in previous acts of existence and we get return feedback from those acts that is stored in the intellective soul to refine our future sign model constructions. So it is a composite, but it's a composite that includes form making and return feedback from previous actualizations. It is a composite. Now the intellective soul functions as the modality of understanding, but there are four more modalities of the soul. There's the nutritive, the sentient, the intellective, which we're working on here, and the locomotive where the soul is going to be posited through the appetite of the will. So the intellective soul is going to work here on the collective possible intellective generalities in order to lift them to signification. And it will enlist the intell intellective principle of discernment, and then it will engage in a self-reflexive work because we're also involved in defining the self. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to, uh, to exist in authentic existential existence? So it is self-reflexive work. We're not just working on history. We're working on history and how that informs us as individual human beings. But the first function of the in intellective principle is to give the intelligible objects abstract universal names or signs, in other words, to give them signification as or to give them existential being. So the very first work that the intellective soul does is to take the intelligible species that are abstracted out of the phantasm, raise them to a sign signification of deeper significance, and that way it gives existential being or existential importance to these intelligible objects. Now we have an existential intelligible objects that count for human existence. We end up with a, an improved and a more substantial and more signifying lexical content of existentially important signs that count for what it means to be a human being. What, what used to be a phantasm became a generalized intelligible species now becomes 
an existentially important signification. And that's the very first work of the intellective soul. But now we get a chance to move on to a very important um, area that's added at this level. Because since our last talk, which ended at 77, we've moved on to page 103, and he added the three internal intellective powers that, that work on this work of raising a generalization to a signification. That's pretty darn important work. So how does that take place? It takes place through memory, intelligence, and practical intellect. Memory, intelligence, and practical intellect. Under memory, memory is formed through an exchange between the agent intellect and possible intellect. Under agent intellect, the agent intellect forms abstractions out of the phantasms. That's that first work of abstraction, of abstracting the intelligible species of the uh, phantasm. Uh, the agent participates in the intellectual divine light, that spark of the divine that's contained within our soul, from Psalm 4-7. Uh, the agent causes the universality to appear and to exist as that abstraction. And D, it makes the intelligible object actually exist for the possible intellect that will go to work on knowledge. So the agent creates the abstract generalization of species, of a, of a universal species. Now, the possible intellect receives the abstracted species, and then it uh, will take these abstracted species and preserve them as intelligible singularities. So the possible intellect forms an intellectual or intelligible memory, an intelligible working memory. And so... In note C, we can see that, therefore, the possible intellect possesses a dispositional knowledge that it holds for later actualization. It holds a potentially powerful dispositional knowledge of intelligible singularities of signification. And it gets created, this memory gets created by the possible intellect when it becomes self-reflexive and thinks about its own thinking. It's the self-reflexive work the existential self-reflexive work that creates this meaningful type of a dispositional memory and dispositional knowledge. So we end up with a memory. Now we move on to intelligence. The intellective soul reaches truth through inference, motion, and argument. One thing grasped by the intellective soul leads to others by inference. The intellective soul bases its reasoning on the intelligible memory that has now been made available. So we can't move on to intelligence until memory goes to work. But now that there is an intelligible memory available, the intellective soul is engaged in acquiring um, its own current base of dispositional knowledge. A, a current working dispositional knowledge needs to be formed. And it will advance from intelligible object to intelligible object to intelligible truth to forming intuited first principles of discerning the true. Uh, Aquinas says that the self actually will form a, a composite of uh, axioms or first principles uh, to be employed and to be refined as we continue through our dialectic. We'll end up with a refined group of principles for interpretation of the true. So this is the modality of knowledge capacity, and it will next open up onto practical reasoning. But through inference, through motion, and through argument at the Dokunta threshold of dialogue, the self acquires a current dispositional knowledge, a current dispositional type knowledge, as an intellection. Aquinas calls it an intellection, or a noesis design. So we end up... Uh, we will travel to that uh, Dakunta threshold of dialogue to do this work of the intelligence, but we will end up uh, discussing uh, interrelatedness between significations. In order to discuss interrelatedness between significations, we can do some true design modeling, which is a noesis. Remember, we're working in the noose. Well, the noose posits a noesis. The noose 
mind posits a noesis design for its intelligible memory of significations. We don't just hold the intelligible memory of significations. We engage in dialogue at the Dakunta threshold of dialogue, and we shape the intelligible memory, the composite, the lexical network, into a noesis design model of signification, a model of universality, of universal truth. And so we find in note H that the intellect of soul has passed through four modalities of agent, of possible intellect, of dispositional knowledge, and of achieved noesis design. Agent, possible, dispositional, and achieved. But from knowledge capacity, we move on to practical intellect, the will. Because remember, the uh, intellective powers are memory, intelligence, and will. Well, under practical intellect, the practical intellect must draw from the universality of the noesis design of truth. So see how the one builds on the other. Each stage builds on the previous stage. Intelligence has given that we started out with uh, an intelligible memory. Intelligence took the intelligible memory and created a noesis design model of universal truth. Now the practical intellect is going to draw upon that universality of a noesis design model of truth, and uh, it will transition to a modality of ethics and uh, work on the acquisition of the good. So the practical intellect works on ethics and the acquisition of the good, but it bases that positing of an ethic on the universality of the noesis design model of the intelligence. And the formation will constitute the content of the posited volitional appetite. So we're going to move into the realm of positing, which is, uh, uh, we discussed before, the volitional appetite of positing. That's the realm of positing. We're going to move on to that volitional appetite of positing, which is going to be involved in a praxis ethical type of positing. That's where we're going to move to next. And so this practical intellect forms the content for that positing. It, it works on content. But how do we direct this ethical content? Well, note D, this praxis content is guided by the self's innate character trait of sunidasis. Sunidasis. This is important for um, Aquinas, this concept of sunidasis. Remember that concept of sunidasis. Sunidasis is the innate divine spark of God consciousness. We are created in the image of God. That's sunidasis. That's the eternal aspect of our soul. It is situated in the intellective soul, the uh, higher intellective powers of the intellective soul. That's where our divine spark of the divine lives and exists, the divine spark of God consciousness, and that is the Greek concept of sunidasis. But because we have this trait that's been imprinted within us at the creation of a sunidasis divine spark, it guides us toward the apprehension of a divine genus of universality for forming a model of the good. We have a, an innate created divine spark that has been given to us by the Lord God as our creator, and it lives in the intellect of soul, and that divine spark is a sunidasis power, a sunidasis dunamis power of potentiality that's going to help us to grasp at a, a higher spiritual in, intuition. We end up having a higher spiritual intuition of being able to grasp that which is the good. But the good always corresponds to the true for um, Aquinas. The good and the true always correspond. So it's a beautiful thing. We ended up uh, moving through the three internal intellective powers, and they all built on each other. Memory gave us the intelligible memory. Intelligence drew on that intelligible memory and formed a noesis design universal model. Practical intellect drew on that noesis design model and formed a model of the ethical good, a model of the ethical good as a content to be posited in the realm of positing. 
But before we get to that realm of positing, of course, we have to move to the Dokunta threshold of dialogue. So if you look on the chart, we're going to move to the dialogue. It's going to go up through Dokeo. And Dokeo means that we approach the dialogue within the church or the dialogue with other selves with our subjective supposed idea of the true. We have our version of the true. This is our version of how we perceive the ethical good, the ethical true. We take that model to the Dakunta threshold of dialogue, and then through dialogue, we're going to exit after dialogue with a phronesis of a, a universal genus, a spiritual universal genus for shaping the uh, lexical network of significations that we possess in our intellective memory. We're going to exit from that dialogue with guidance as to how to better shape our idea of the good. So that's a very key element. We, end, we gain a lot through dialogue with others. We gain a lot on refining the interrelatedness between signs and how to form a better model for acquiring the good. And that takes us to 5b, which is the proprium. The proprium, we exit the Dakunta threshold with the relevant mark of universality refined out of the significations. This mark is called the proprium principle. We leave the Dakunta threshold with the phronesis of a genus of universal tone. And that's the way the Greek describes it. It describes it as a tone, a tonality of universality, a genus of universal tone a tone to all truth we're considering. And that will imprint all of our significations. So we have this, this universal tone, and it will be coupled with the substantial significations that we hold in the intellective memory of the intellective soul. And then together, we will work as the extrinsic agent, and we will form an accidental praxis form for positing of a highly refined, more precise, ethical model for acquiring the good. One that has been refined through dialogue with others within the church fellowship. One that has been refined through dialogue with others at the Dokunta threshold. And so we have that proprium coupled with substance to reach accidental praxis form, propositing our model of the good. That takes us to the realm of positing, and the realm of positing is most assuredly the volitional appetite. The body is moved through the volitional appetite. And so the positive form of the intellect offers uh, different levels of perfection. But the per most perfect form that we will ever develop will be a form that can become um, and eventually inherently present in matter at all times without mediation. If we can reach that kind of, that kind of correspondence between form and matter, we will have reached the most perfect form. And we can actually make that form a virtual objective existence in reality. So this posited form as an in existence becomes the first actuality of the truth, the first actuality of the good as conceptual. And for Aquinas, this is the realm of spirit. We have When we enter the realm of positing, when we enter the realm of ethical positing, I should say, we're involved in ethics now and trying to acquire God's goodness of the kingdom. When we enter into the realm of ethical positing, we enter into the realm of spirit for Aquinas. And that act of existence that we are seeking to enact is an act to raise up the kingdom of God toward God's goodness, which we are informed of and encouraged toward because of the spark of the divine that lives within us as a sunidasis. The soon iodasis imprints our soul and our imprinted and our empowered and our indwelt soon iodasis soul goes out of itself in positing an ethical model of the good. And this ethical model of the good will enact itself through the act of existence. And when it, and it, and it, when it enacts itself through the act of existence, there will be feedback. And the feedback will do what? It will return to the intellective soul because it's a composite. It'll return to the intellective soul to help us uh, work on a further refinement of the model formation of the good that we work on all the time as we continue the dialectical loop 
over and over again. A lot of content and uh, I apologize for the small print but I wanted to get 105 pages on one table which we did so uh, it's there but we've gone from a uh, sentient soul to the four internal sentient powers to the intellective soul to the three internal and intellective powers of memory intelligence and will onto the Dakunta threshold of dialogue to refine our model of the good and then on to the um, actual uh, formation of that uh, model uh, based on a uh, synthesis of the uh, refinement coming out of the Dakunta threshold as a propriam coupled with the substance of our significations in order to reach an accidental form of praxis ethical positing. Then we take that accidental form of ethical positing and we posit it in the volitional appetite and that provides the inertia for the act of existence and that creates feedback and return all the way back to the block one of sentient soul.